Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you, and I want to I want to thank Brendan and uh, Jay and and Amy especially. You know, getting across country is always a challenge, and she did the logistics so well. So so happy I could be here with you all, and uh, and hope to to give you a talk to to something to ponder and think about um, based on a journey I took to Idaho in 2016. Um, this is a story that matters. This is what I tell my students at Ohio State. Um, and it's a story that matters because it should matter to every single man, woman, and child who's interested in where our food is going to come from in the next several decades and what the future of food actually looks like. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is the world's most famous and popular and widely used herbicide, Roundup. And I want to start not with this awesome picture that my friend from Utah took. Uh, I will come back to this in a second. But I want to start with some shocking headlines. Some shocking headlines that have just come across you know, airwaves and across newspapers in recent uh, months. So in August of 2018, the Monsanto company, which has now been bought out by a German company called Bayer, or actually in Germany they call it Bayer, so this Bayer buyout, uh, Roundup has come under close scrutiny uh, and this, this was the, the herbicide that, that Monsanto had made going back to the 1970s, but that buyer had bought. And this herbicide Roundup, its key ingredient is called glyphosate. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that key ingredient in a second. But what has transpired recently has been truly shocking. In August of 2018, a jury in San Francisco found in favor of this man, Dwayne Johnson, who you can see here kind of poignantly crying, uh, because what, what he just has found out is that he has won $289 million, one person, $289 million, in a court case in which the jury found that his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was linked to his exposure to Roundup. He was a groundskeeper at a school He'd worked for decades uh, gardening and working with students in, 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 in this landscape and had used Roundup day after day. And the jury discovered that they thought there was enough evidence that there was a link between his health problems and the use of Roundup. This was mind-blowing, right? A $289 million verdict against Monsanto uh, and, and by association Bayer, which had just bought out this company. I mean, immediately after this news broke, Bayer's stock price dropped by 10%. And Bayer is, you know, at this point, is the largest seed distributor, one of the largest agricultural companies in terms of providing the infrastructure uh, agricultural uh, industries need. It is one of the largest companies in that industry. And the, the future of this is kind of in question because there are 8,000 other cases now pending related to Roundup. And if you can imagine $289 million multiplied by 8,000, this could be devastating for buyer. What's its future? We simply don't know. But I think what's interesting is that this court case was appealed. And the appellate judge confirmed the lower court's decision, upheld that lower court's decision. Reducing the damages, she decided that the damages were just too exorbitant, but she reduced them to $78 million. So even on appeal, this is held up. Does this mean that Roundup causes cancer? I cannot argue that before you today. But what I can tell you is that a jury decided that there was enough evidence to warrant this person getting this kind of massive verdict as a result of that. Okay? So for me, and I think that what's so interesting about that is $289 million. You know, Monsanto was involved in another big case, and that was related to Agent Orange. This was a herbicide that was used during the Vietnam War that veterans were exposed to that contained a contaminant known as dioxin. Dioxin is what uh, Dow Chemical called 
the most toxic chemical man has ever created. And it told that to Monsanto in 1965 at the same moment we were using this in the Vietnam War to defoliate the jungle so we could see our enemy in Vietnam. Veterans were exposed to this in a massive course case in 1987 found in favor of the veterans that they should receive compensation for the health problems they might be, be finding uh, associated with their Agent Orange uh, exposure. That court case was around $200 million for thousands of veterans. Each veteran maybe received a few thousand dollars for that. So the scale of this is truly remarkable. We're living in kind of historic times. Now, I became, first became really interested in this topic long before 2018. I actually got interested in it in 2015 because at that moment, we saw another blockbuster headline moment. And this was the World Health Organization coming out with a study that said that they had determined that Roundup, again with this active ingredient glyphosate, was a probable human carcinogen. Ah, you know, I thought when I read this, this is pretty crazy because of how much Roundup is being used today. And of course, this was contested. Monsanto contested this. Weed scientists that I've been working with at Ohio State contested this. There's been lots of debate over the cancer causing properties of Roundup. I'm not going to prove one way or the other today that these things are true. I'm laying out the history of what's happened in the last several years. And what happened here was the EPA then went in to do its own investigation in 2016. Very contentious debates. I talked to people inside the EPA about what was going on with that. Ultimately, EPA decided they did not have enough evidence to link Roundup to cancer. And so this debate has kind of been going back and forth. And these cases have been these really monumental moments where we're letting juries decide, well, what does the evidence show? So this is the news. And I think it matters to every single one of us. This is not an academic issue. This is an academic talk in some ways, but this is an issue that should matter to all of us. Whatever the outcome is, it should matter. And here's why. This is Roundup, and actually glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. Glyphosate, there are generic versions of uh, Roundup that just have glyphosate in them. So, so you can imagine this isn't just the brand Roundup, this is other glyphosate herbicides, but, but they're all stem from this Roundup technology. And what you see is that that's 1994 with Roundup use around the country, okay, on farms. This comes from a USDA report in 2017, and I've been fortunate to work with Stephen Duke uh, on some of his studies to confirm some of this stuff. And in 2014, you can see this remarkable change. Roundup is absolutely everywhere. This shows you, I don't know if you can see it very well, but an estimated use on agricultural land in pounds per square mile. And the very lightly shaded sections are about 4.52 pounds per square mile of this stuff. By, of course, you see 2014, we're talking about 88 pounds per square mile. That's a 17-fold increase in the use in this, of this herbicide over the last 10, uh, 20 years. This is a remarkable change in how we do agriculture in this country. Why is it that Roundup became so popular? What was it that explains, you know, my students see this and they say, well, what happened? You know, why did we start using Roundup so much? Because Roundup, as they know, well, as we teach it, was first used going back to the mid-1970s. So Roundup's been around for a very long time. What happened was Roundup Ready technology. We first started seeing in 1996, the first genetically engineered crops, soybeans were the first, that were genetically engineered to be resistant to Roundup. And what that meant was you could use Roundup on your crops after they started growing because it wouldn't kill your crops. And you could eliminate weeds during the growing season because you have these Roundup Ready crops, okay? And just to show you the scale and the pace of change that I'm, I'm, I'm looking into as I research this story, this is, again is from the USDA. Look at 1996. That's a revolution right there. That is a dramatic change in how we grow our food. That shows you this is looking at GRC, glyphosate-resistant crops, and the adoption rate 
from 1996 to 2016. What you see is that within 20 years, we went from basically having no glyphosate resistant crops, genetically engineered to be resistant, to about 89% of our corn being glyphosate resistant and about 94% of our soybeans being glyphosate resistant. Even if you're a vegan eating tofu person, okay, and you're eating that soy in the United States, it's not organic and you can't prove that it's not GMO, it probably is. So that, that, that's, this is the reality. And that's not to say it's either bad or wrong. Is this technology good or bad? That's not the debate for today. But it's to show you the history of what's happened in the last 20 years. And to be aware of this versus that. And why, you know, we got to get this right, <laughs> right? Because this stuff not only ends up uh, in farms, but we've seen studies that show it also ends up in cereals and in food. And scientists would argue that, many scientists would argue that it's not a problem, it's in low concentrations and it doesn't affect our health. Point is, it matters. And some of you in here I know are scientists, and the reason I go around talking is because, and you're young, is I'm excited to see what you create. These are real issues that we need to look into to figure out you know, what's going on uh, with the chemicals we use to produce our food. Okay, so that's, this is kind of an overview for those of you who might not be familiar with it. Now I get to the fun stuff, okay? Because that's what we know. That's what the headlines have been talking about. That's what the newspapers are all uh, doing in here. There, there's faculty that are interested in this. They, they probably know all this already. But the thing that we're not talking about, the thing that interestingly has not made any of the news, is a story that happens right in our backyard here in Idaho, close enough, uh, about 200 miles away about two hours, two and a half hours away, maybe three hour drive from here. And that is the story not of the back end environmental pollution issues of the use of Roundup on farms and what it might do to consumers, but the front end story, the story of the environmental cost associated with producing Roundup in the first place, the supply side story of Roundup. And that's what I want to talk about today. Okay, is what are the ecological costs of producing Roundup in, in the, at the very beginning of its life cycle? And why this matters is it matters to y'all because it's right here. The starting point for Roundup is Soda Springs, Idaho. Again, just a short jaunt from here. And when I came to research this, I flew into Salt Lake City and drove up with a gentleman who is in Utah who took all the photos you're going to see today. So local talent is going to be featured today on this, okay? And what I'd like to do for this part is I want you to close your eyes, okay? I want you to close your eyes for a second because I want to transport you back in time. So if you would, I know it seems weird to close your eyes and talk like this, but take a second, close your eyes. And I, want to, I want to start the story in a place, okay? So imagine this. It's June of 2016. You're out in the uh, kind of foothills of southeast Idaho. You're, you're near Caribou Targhee National Forest. You can see mountains off in the distance. It's dusk. It's about 9 o'clock, June night. It's kind of warm. And you're standing on a pickup truck just a few feet away from a barbed wire fence that is the only thing separating you from this massive charcoal-colored mound of waste. And you're looking up at this pile of waste, and now you can open your eyes if you would, and this is what you see. It's nighttime, guys. <laughs> the brightness of this hot lava-like sludge actually lights up the night sky so bright that it looks more like day than it does dusk. And we're stand this is where I was, standing there on top of this truck, kind of watching this dumping of this lava-like sludge down this mountain of waste. And what we were looking at was phosphate slag, the byproduct waste product of producing elemental phosphorus, which is the active ingredient in glyphosate 
Roundup, okay? This is the starting point for Roundup. This is where Roundup's elemental phosphorus, which is the key ingredient in making glyphosate, comes from in Idaho, and we're standing there, and this is the waste products that's produced as a byproduct of that, this phosphate slag. Now, my photographer friend and I were there, and we were watching this, and about every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, this is what you see. You see these cauldrons coming to the edge of a cliff and dumping this waste down the side of the mountain. Now, at about this point, I started questioning the prudence of our decision to stand where we were standing. And I'll keep going with some photos here, and you'll see the moment in which I actually go into my car. Because we were watching it at a very close uh, distance, and I actually began to feel a little ill, because we had just met with a radiological scientist in Pocatello, Idaho, who had told us that this waste is radioactive that it has small, small concentrations of radium and uranium, and that it emits gamma radiation. Now, we were assured that short-term exposure to this, we're talking about low levels of radiation, that there wasn't going to be any health effects for being there or anything like that. But again, this was a little less than an academic issue when the lava, like sludge, was coming straight towards you. And I started thinking maybe we had made not such a great decision to come to this location. And I just wanted to give you the sense it's, it was like looking into the sun, just the scale of this. And this is the hot phosphate slag waste because they have to heat up phosphate rocks so hot to about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit to get this purified element of phosphorus that this stuff is cooking. And when I mean cooking, I mean cooking, okay? And there you go. And at that point, I was definitely in the car. Now, you can see my friend John. He's a, he's a search and rescue guy. He might be out there saving you guys one day on the mountains if you're skiing or doing something you shouldn't be doing. Uh, he, you can see he has no fear. He just stood there the entire time and took shots of this uh, with you know, this amazing radiating heat coming off of all this. So that's what you're seeing at the start of the hour here. You were seeing a floral representation, which I think is kind of Beautiful in many ways, right? It's got a flower representation on the front side of, of this facility that is owned by Monsanto, now a buyer, in southeast Idaho that represents these cauldrons dumping radioactive waste. <laughs> okay? And it's a remarkable story because this is an active Superfund site. And for those of students who might not know what Superfund is, uh, we created an act in 1980 for a little environmental history here that said, okay, for certain places that are so toxic that they need to be cleaned up immediately, we're going to call those places Superfund sites. And we're going to create a super fund based on taxes and other things that will help us clean up those sites. These are the most toxic sites, really, in the country. And this site achieved that status, what was called national priority listing, a priority for cleanup, in 1990. And if you might say, it looks like it's still operating, I would tell you the answer is yes. And I called up the EPA's regional head and said, is it odd that this site is still operating since it's still non-compliant with Superfund remediation over three decades after it, you, you called it a Superfund site? And they said, yeah, that is strange. So that's when I decided to write about it. And so this is an active Superfund site. Again, it is the origins of the elemental phosphorus that is the key ingredient in glyphosate that makes Roundup. This is the starting point. The Roundup revolution that has changed the world is right here. In many ways, it is a, Amer a story of the American West. The origins of Roundup, and just to give you a sense, if you've ever used it or seen it, this is what Roundup looks like. You can buy it in Home Depot or Lowe's. It's not only for farmers, it's available for gardeners and everyone else. And we put it on all sorts of things. Now, what's interesting about this story, and there's Soda Springs, is to give you a little bit of, uh, some of you have probably been there, or been through there if you're going to Yellowstone or you're going to Pocatello or other places. Um, but this town is quite small. It's about 3,000 people, and one of the things I like to do when I write is to actually go to the places that you're studying. And this is just a tip for, again, students that are in the room. If you're a writer, 
I think it matters that you actually know what you're talking about when you go and you write about a place. You should go and be with the people. You should talk to them. You should get a sense of what the landscape's like. So I spent some time and actually camped out and around these super fun sites. It was a really cool camping trip uh, to look into all of this. And 3,000 student, 3,000 people were there when I was there. Um, and Monsanto first came here in 1952. They started phosphate mining and producing elemental phosphorus in 1952. And from 1952 to about 1977, here's the, the wildest thing for your notes, okay? They sold that phosphate slag to the town of Soda Springs. So the town built their sidewalks, their roadways, their home foundations out of this waste that contained radium and contained gamma radi you know, would release gamma, gamma radiation. About 50% of the homes in Soda Springs were concerned uh, are, 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 uh, have phosphate slag embedded into their foundations today. And if you might think that might be a concern, well, that's what the EPA thought. So in 1987, they conducted an aerial, radio, uh, aerial uh, radiological survey of this city to see if they could see where gamma radiation was coming from. And what they found was that there were hot spots all over the town. Low levels, we're not talking about massive amounts of radiation, but radiation that was above background levels. And that, over time, might very well have effects on the health of those living in these homes. They specifically were concerned about teenagers who liked to play Nintendo and games in the basement because they would be sitting down in these basement foundations eating Doritos for a very long time and potentially getting radioactive exposure, okay? And that's what one of the people that they said, definitely tell your teenagers to get out of their basements. And they came into this town and they said, we're going to make you clean this stuff up. Here's where it gets interesting if it's not already interesting enough. There's about three other twists in this, okay? The town rebelled against the EPA. The town said, get out of here. You're going to declare our town a Superfund site? You know what it's going to do for our home values? This is why it matters that you go to talk to people, because you want to get to know how they feel about things and how, how they perceive this issue. And in this case, the town did not like what the EPA was saying because they said, well, what is, if you declare us a Superfund site, the city itself, and you, and you say that this is all radioactive, you blow the whistle on this, then, you know, how are we going to sell our homes? It's the most valuable possession we own, right? There was real dollar and cents, and not just crass, but think about a, a, a father or mother who's trying to take care of his family, thinking about this, right? And they said, EPA, back off. Don't aggressively pursue this. Let us work with Monsanto and the phosphate companies to deal with this problem. And it's, it's, a, it's a prime moment in the EPA history that this happens because the EPA is at this moment trying to decentralize their decision making and give back more local control to communities. They believe that the best way to be effective is to let local people make decisions. And so in this case, that's what happens. This phosphate slag is never removed immediately from the town. Instead, what happens is Monsanto, the very polluters who actually created the problem in the first place, helped to develop the solution to the problem. And what they propose is this guidelines, this graded guidelines for how to deal with phosphate slag. This graded guidelines does include the potential, if it's really, really bad, we can remove this stuff from your home foundations. But the main things that Monsanto pushes for and these companies push for is education. Change your habits, folks, okay? That's the best way to limit your exposure to this. We shouldn't remove that waste. You should do things like, and I'll quote, and you can see at the very bottom here, you should, quote, spend less time in your basement, okay? That's the solution to this problem. Now, again, citizens in the town saw this is good. Think about it. What are you going to do? You're going to have this whole house taken, foundation taken out? We're going to live the Holiday Inn for a while. You know, how is this going to play out? So a lot of people said this is a good decision on this. But the point here is that radioactive slag still remains in this community. And that waste pile you just saw at the beginning is expanding. They have no place to put that stuff because they can't sell it anymore because we know that it presents these human health issues. 
And it's literally, if you go to Soda Springs, you'll see this massive mountain. It's growing bigger and bigger by the day, and it is expanding closer to the city, which will present potentially environmental issues down the road. For now, it just sits around that barbed wire fence, and you could see how close we could get to it. That is just part of the story. Because if we travel out to the mine sites themselves, they are super fun sites as well. So the places where they extracted the phosphate ore are all around this phosphate facility. And you can see, I just want to give you a sense of the scale of the, you know, it doesn't even take someone who, you know, is studying environmental history for a very long time to see that this has a pretty big environmental impact on the mountain landscape in southeast Idaho. And you can see, especially these three mines were all targeted for super fun cleanup. The Henry Mine, the Enoch Valley Mine, and Ballard Mine, these were all Monsanto mines. And the big issue with these mine sites were overburden piles. So overburden, as you can see on the far right over there, is kind of the rock and the leftover stuff that you don't want after you've mined out the ore that you want. The problem with that overburden is that it's heavy in heavy metals and in things like selenium, an element that is found naturally in nature, but in high concentrations can be toxic to humans and to animals. And the selenium and heavy metals were leaching into grasslands and into streams in southeast Idaho, affecting one of the most pristine cutthroat trout streams, uh, the Blackfoot River, uh, that goes by all these mine sites. And you say, well, did anything happen? The answer is yes. Hundreds of animals were found dead from eating grass that was contaminated with selenium. They had selenium poisoning, so the grass was basically uptaking this selenium into the grass, right? And you saw livestock being killed. Now, ranchers, uh, talking with Jay about ranching, you know, ranchers were very upset about this. And a lot of people said, you know, you killed some of my livestock as a result of this. And it, it created quite uh, an issue, and they're still trying to deal with some of the selenium leaching from these sites. But that's only part of the story. Because if we go back to the processing plant, in order to process that phosphate ore, you have to heat up these kilns to, again, over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, requires an insane amount of electricity. I was fortunate to have an interview with the Monsanto engineer, who's no longer with Monsanto, who worked at the plant and was able to give me the details on this. This plant used more electricity in the 2000 teens than the city of Salt Lake. The plant, the facility itself, was using more electricity annually than the city, according to their calculations. And I was able to triangulate to other data in uh, the historical record. I filed Freedom of Information Act requests and other things, and it's, it seems pretty accurate. They were spending roughly $60 million a year on electricity, just electricity, to heat up the kilns to make this stuff. So when we think about the ecological cost of Roundup, and the environmental inputs, these are not a part of the equations. We're not talking about this stuff, but we should be, right? And not just that, because when you heat up these kilns, you can see the air pollution that's going up into the air. And one of the biggest issues has been mer mercury, which has been coming from these plants, uh, this particular plant. In fact, a study that was done by an investigative reporter in the state with the Spokesman Review found that over 90% of the entire state of Idaho's mercury emissions were coming from this one facility producing Roundup. 90% of mercury. And those, those numbers, by the way, just to give you a sense of scale, those are on par with the top 10 biggest coal power plants that were tasked by Obama for needing cleanup because of their mercury emissions. It's in the same category as those under the clean power program that Obama had pushed for in the 2000 teens. So incredible scale of effects. And I think none of this, none of this fits with this argument that Roundup is part of an environmentally responsible weed control program and our vision for a sustainable agriculture and environmental protection. It is something that is off the grid and we don't talk about, but should be part of the conversation when we think about the sustainability of Roundup, right? And, and the cost associated with it, not just the back-end cost, but the supply-side cost. 
So let me end with this. A sec just a short section here. Come on. Like how on earth did these pollution problems persist for so long? If the EPA had declared this place a Superfund site in the mine sites, Superfund sites going back to 1990, how on earth has this been allowed to continue? Because it's important to remember, let's get to those farmers and those ranchers, not everybody was okay with this. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the EPA for students who might want to do investigative reporting or are sticking around later, I'm happy to talk to you about how to do this type of stuff. It's one of the things I've really honed over the last several years, and it's one of the great ways to get at information that's just not available. Filing a Freedom of Information Act request with the government so you can get documents that otherwise you can't get. And what I found were these letters from farmers that just weren't, you know, just weren't being written about, where they were saying, wait a minute. Look at this. We disagree very something with the convenient rezoning proposal and will pursue with some diligence the requirement to clean up by excavation, removal, and replacement. We want the area around the facility where this guy, Robert Gunnell, had his farm to be cleaned up. He said, Monsanto is the polluter. Because the EPA was telling him, you know, we're just going to force you not to use part of your land because it's too contaminated. He said, what? It's my land, right? Why should we, the Gunnell family, and the affected private property owner suffer the loss of use of our, or be subjected to the potential danger of exposure, right? Why should we be forced to take on these costs that we didn't, that we didn't create? And the best letter was from his 89-year-old mother. Charlotte, who wrote in and, uh, you know, massive letter saying, hey, listen to my son, you know, he's right on this. He says, we, I feel like I'm trespassing on my own property. That's how she felt about it. So people were upset, but here's what's interesting. Probably the most interesting find of the story. Many of these people that were disgruntled ultimately came around. And they came around because the EPA offered them options. One of the interesting things I found was that it wasn't so much that the EPA came in and cleaned up sites that made some of these people happy. It was simply offering them the freedom to choose the option to excavate and remove that pollution that gave people the feeling of empowerment to say, OK, well, you've given me the choice. I'll take the money from Monsanto. That they're going to buy a part of my land, and I'll take that instead. Okay. In other words, one of the things I found was that the, 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 the ways in which choice was handed out to people you know, as a kind of uh, commodity that could be used to get compliance with what EPA wanted to do, which was essentially not excavate this territory because it was going to be expensive. And they tried to, to tell the farmers that. And so the Gunnels ultimately had a portion of their land bought out by Monsanto. Other landowners I looked at did as well. But they were only part of the story. If we look at the majority of the people in this town of Soda Springs, the EPA found in 1991 that over 5,000 jobs were directly related to the phosphate industry. Over 500 jobs in a town of 3,000 people. And think of a family of three, you're talking about 1,500 people. I mean, this is the money maker for this community. If this is not a story of Love Canal, a place where the town revolted against this company who had dumped all this waste in their backyard. And I'd argue the reason it's not a Love Canal is because that chemical company in Love Canal was no longer there to employ people. It was gone. In this case, Monsanto and these phosphate industries were the lifeblood of the community. And the biggest thing people pointed out was that we were concerned about losing jobs, we were concerned about losing our livelihoods, if we had been more aggressive on trying to clean up this waste and our homes. Here is a Soda Springs home listed in Realtor. I do not know if it has radioactive foundation or not, but that was the other thing. What are we going to do? In other words, to answer that question of why it is that we don't know about this story, it's because the people in Soda Springs really don't want us to know about this story. And they have good reason, right? There are a lot of personal, family, livelihood reasons why a community would resist more aggressive stances that would say, no, Monsanto, you've got to shut down your plant until you fix this. Or you cannot open up a new mine site until you've cleaned up the mine sites that are Superfund sites from the past. 
that's what's so crazy. As this was happening, as they were discovering all this and declaring all these places Superfund sites, the government was approving new mine sites closer to the Blackfoot River. Right? And so um, this is a story where you know, a town has made a choice about, uh, about risk and to live with risk. But I think it's a story, and I'll end with this, that, that, that over time, you know, these pollution problems are, are persisting. Chemicals of concern are still leaching from the site. I have the newest report from 2018. It says these things are not contained. That's 2018. And if these environmental issues persist, might the environment be changing in a way that will be beyond the power of these people to choose a better future? And that's why I write about this. That's why I care about it. Because not only does it matter to Soda Springs, I think it matters to all of us. Um, thank you very much for, for being here, and I look forward to taking your questions. Any questions out there? Yes, sir. So, um, what type of an economic footprint does Monsanto have on Soda Springs in terms of employment income? Twenty-one million dollar payroll, I think, in two thousand and eight. Twenty-one million dollar payroll is what that one facility uh, said was in terms of the amount of that. So, you think for three thousand people? I mean, again, when you hang out with these individuals or you look at these community involvement uh, assessments, um, that five hundred job figure I think was low. I found a figure from Monsanto that said they were employing somewhere around 400 people directly, right? So again, in a town of 3,000 people, yeah, it was interesting coming in to write about this because I thought I was going to come in and be like, let me tell your story, you know? And they said, don't tell our story, right? It, we, we value this, this industry. And trying to get that right in the writing is very difficult. It's a human story. Monsanto is often referred to as Monsatan around the world, right? And people think of this as this terrible thing. And part of what I'm trying to do is to create a human story here about the, the real lives of real people that are being affected by this and why they make the choices they do. It's easy to say they're just dumb or bad, well, you know, but that's not the reality. They're making choices based on these very real economic, you know, $21 million payroll, you know, 500 jobs coming from this facility, you know? You, you, you stand up to say, if we push too hard in this company, what if we, we lose them, you know? Um, my, my personal feeling, and I'll shut up after this, is Monsanto can't afford to abandon this place. That if they were forced to, they would have to. So creating a really tough bar and saying, no, you have to excavate this and we got to clean this up before you move on, they would have to do it because this elemental phosphorus is literally they ship this all around the world. It goes to plants in Luling, uh, Louisiana. It goes to Kamakari, Brazil, where I'm traveling in March. It goes to Argentina, and that's where they formulate the finished product that they sell everywhere. This is the starting point. It is, it, and this is the biggest brand for them. To lose this would be to lose everything. So um, not only is it a big deal for the people in Soda Springs, it's a big deal for the company. Yes, ma'am. How far are the effects of yeah, I mean, in this case, and I, I mean, it doesn't, I haven't seen it, you know, go cross state boundaries and come here to Provo. Uh, that would be a really compelling story. Um, but it, it, it travels pretty far because these plumes can get in these kind of groundwater channels and it can end up in, you know, a long distance from that, that mine or, or overburdened site. And that's the issue is that, you know, it, it, they're having a tough time containing it because these plumes are kind of going everywhere. And it's also a story of, of not detecting it early enough. So they did so much mining and did all this stuff and then started, you know, realizing that this stuff was spreading everywhere. So some of this selenium is like, you know, it's coming from old practices um, that, that date back many years. So it, it's quite expansive how far this stuff can go. There's no indication, though, that the town of Soda Springs water supply has been effective because of the way I've been looking at the kind of groundwater flows. And it seems like Soda Springs water supply itself is OK for now. But what would the long-term cost of all this be? Yes, sir. And then here. Um, you show this map of the United States. So if you take Iowa, for example, which was you know, 
pretty solid uh, in terms of percentage of, of uh, use. Traffic to Utah was pretty low percentage. So has somebody done the research looking at cancer rates? Not yet, to my knowledge, and I think it's a great Y'all hear this? <laughs> Whoever's in here? That's why I love these talks is because I think this is like an incredible thing to do. I'll tell you another thing that no one did and that I'm doing right now that no one's done thoroughly is to compare GE crop yields versus conventional yields. To compare over the last 25 years what we can say about conventionally bred corn versus genetically engineered Roundup resistant corn and whether the yields are actually significantly different. And I've been working with the National Academy of Sciences, the USDA, the top weed scientists at Ohio State. And the most shocking thing I've probably discovered in all of this is that when you look at those yield charts, you see yield increases for sure, but there has been no change, dramatic change in the slope of that curve post genetically engineered seed introduction. In other words, on yield, we are not seeing this feed the world new green revolution yet. That doesn't mean that that technology could do that. But this is the kind of analysis, large scale, that we can now do because we, that's why history matters to me, right? We now have, this is, the book's supposed to come out at the 25th anniversary of Roundup Ready Technology. So that we now have 25 years to look at for the first time to say, did it work? And to your point, what happened in these pockets where we put so much of this stuff compared to, say, Utah? Can we see differences there? Um, it's a great uh, proposal for an epidemiology study. So I was just going to go off what you said and ask if there were any like concrete professions that are like seen specific to Southern Idaho because of the presence of Monsanto. Yeah, this was one of the biggest things that they pointed out, the mayor pointed out. He, um, when this news broke of the radiological survey in 19, it kind of reached the public instead of Springs, the final report, kind of in 1990. And the mayor called it a bombshell, but then he went, public and said, look, the study basically says, and this was a wildly, it's unclear whether this was an accurate statistic or not, um, but he was reading the data and he said, you know, it, the study only says that one, only one out of about a thousand of us will actually get cancer as a result of this anyways, right? So we should worry about it too much, right? It's, not, it's low scale. And then he said, look at our cancer rate right now. It's actually quite low. And that's true, partially because because you're in Soda Springs and you're not exposed to a lot of radiation, other radiation and other issues because you're in this small town, those cancer rates are low. The point here though is that that's, it is, there is no doubt that that slag elevates the low level of radiation that these people are being exposed to. And we also know that we don't know exactly what that means for every different body. You know, does that low level for that teenager sitting in that basement affect him or not? These are risk choices these people are making, and they're making it on somewhat sound evidence, saying, you know, "Look at our cancer rates; they're not particularly high. You know, we're not. We shouldn't be particularly concerned about this. Maybe we can regulate this like radon, um, but it's still a risk. It's still a risk that they've agreed to take on, right? So, it's interesting. Yes, sir." Is there an alternative way to extract phosphate of the that they're using in our other mines around the world? There are, um, so a lot of phosphate comes from Florida in the U.S., um, but this particular process is, uh, uses electricity to heat it up to get a very pure elemental phosphorus, which is the key here. It's this, this kind of cooking process that generates the type of purity they need for glyphosate. Apparently they need a very pure elemental phosphorus. The other facilities use what's known as a wet process, and it uses acids as opposed to electricity. So you actually see a reduction in the amount of electricity use to process phosphate ore. But that, the, the byproduct of that is often used for fertilizers and things like that. It doesn't have the same purity as, as is produced in this electrical process, if that makes any sense. This is all coming from an industrial engineer who's explained this to me, and a chemical engineer who's been explaining it to me. And that, that seems to make sense to me that, that part of the deal here is that they needed a particularly pure form of this stuff and that's why they had to have all this electrical uh, infrastructure. And by the way, originally they did this in Tennessee in a town called Monsanto, Tennessee. And uh, it was called Monsanto, Tennessee until it wasn't called Monsanto, Tennessee when they realized, you know what, the Superfund site we've left here as well. Maybe we, should, uh, maybe we shouldn't call the town Monsanto. 
and uh, it went back to being called Columbia, Tennessee, which is where it, what it's called today. Um, and there they were using TVA power. So they were tapping into the TVA dams to get that electricity. So as I understand it, that's the big difference is that what makes this facility unique is, the, is that its element of phosphorus is really pure and it's coming from this electrical process. Here and then in the back. What's the percentage of the phosphorus from the mines you discussed that goes to this plant and what percent of the phosphorus from the plant is used for glyphosate? Based on what I've read in court records, it seems like this is the majority of what's going into Roundup. So in other words, this is like the vein for Monsanto's glyphosate. In terms of how much of the phosphate rock percentage-wise is going in or ore is going into this facility, um, there are other big players there. So I would say, I don't know that percentage, but I would imagine that it would be in the ballpark of 30 or something like that percent, because the other uh, ore is going to FMC to produce fertilizer, and Agrium, which is also there, and producing fertilizer from this phosphate ore. Um, so FMC is another big player. In fact, you can almost, yeah, it's too hard for you guys to see it, but often the distance that way is an FMC phosphate ore facility. Um, I don't know if 30 is right, but there are big players there that aren't just Monsanto. But Monsanto is one of the biggest. So you talked about how it, uh, um, uh, um, well, it's, it's only dangerous to human animals in a large quantity. Correct. And, and then you mentioned how it, it's leaching into the ground and possibly waterways. I'm just curious, if it is leaching um, into waterways, waterways have a pretty good capacity to disperse things, could it potentially become unharmful um, through the waterway, or, or do you think the risk still remains? That's not what the Greater Yellowstone Coalition has found. Um, they have found that the selenium concentration in fish in these cutthroat trout streams are elevated and to a degree that is concerning. Um, and one of the communities that's been really up in arms about this is the Shoshone Bannock uh, tribal community that I met with um, and had a meeting with their tribal council to talk about this, who said, look, we fish in these streams every single day. This isn't just a matter of like going out there for sport fishing. This is something that we you know, depend on for kind of uh, food. And, and the studies have shown that those fish have high concentrations of selenium, which could be potentially, in the long term, problematic for people consuming it. Um, the Daily Show, weirdly, actually came out, like Jon Stewart, <laughs> and did an expose on the stream itself, looking at uh, fish with three eyes and things like that. Now, were the fish with three eyes caused by selenium? I'm not going to stand up here, especially on, on record, and say that. I don't know that for sure. But there's been a lot of concern about how this is affecting aquatic life in the rivers. In other words, I wouldn't say that we've seen evidence of that dissipation. We see that it's been bioaccumulating in the fish. Yes, sir. A little bit um, question more reason to like your like, initial hope with the Monsanto lawsuit. Um, what do you think are some of the repercussions of allowing juries who don't have a scientific training or statistical understanding to be the ones to make a decision that's largely dependent on scientific information. Yeah, I would say that the history that I've written about so far would say it's a terrible way to go about this because this, is, this rarely has happened on things that it should have happened for. So take T45T, which is the main ingredient in Agent Orange. So I wrote a history of the town. I go to the towns where this stuff is made because I like the local stories. The town where Agent Orange was made is called Nitro. You can't make this stuff up. People say write fiction. Fiction is not as interesting as nonfiction. The town's called Nitro, and it's Nitro, West Virginia. The chapter's just called Nitro. It's just a great name, right? And that town, they produced T45T going back to the 1940s. Workers were in there for decades producing one of the most toxic chemicals that any chemical company has ever made. I start off the chapter this way. Ray Boggess had his face peeled off five times had to pay to get it, uh, and Monsanto paid for it. It was the least they could do, because his face was having chloracne because of his exposure to Agent Orange day after day after day. And instead of seeing that as a sign of, you know what, this stuff maybe shouldn't be dumped on our veterans, 
or on the, on the Vietnamese, uh, it, we, we proceeded to do it not only in the United States. We used Agent T45T on gardens. You should read the New York Times. It's great stuff. We'll kill all your weeds in your garden. We Agent Oranged our gardens. And then we brought it overseas and then found out how toxic this stuff was. Long story short there, they went to, they went to trial. It was the largest case in West Virginia history against Monsanto. And they didn't get a single cent because the jury could not find that under West Virginia law that Monsanto had acted willfully, wantonly, and with reckless behavior. So that tort case was an example of a, a clear case where dioxin was being exposed, where people's faces were being peeled off, and they had records of it going back to the 1950s. And the jury, by the way, the, 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 the head of that jury was a, a person who worked at Union Carbide. So, you know, you've got certain perceptions there. They didn't get a single cent. Not only did they get a single cent, Monsanto, to try and discourage them from continuing an appeal, put liens out on their homes and said, pay for our court costs to these workers who were in West Virginia who barely finished high school. So, you know, I think tort is a way of, of uh, often you get these big cases that'll make things change, and that's, that's a cool use of it. But I see examples throughout the history of, of Monsanto that suggest it's not the best way to prevent people from getting sick. And it's also happening after the fact. These guys, a lot of these guys died from cancer um, before they even got to trial. It was their widows that were in that court case, and they didn't get a cent. Um, and even just take the veterans, I'll stop on that. When that veteran's case was decided, and they settled for, what, $200 million for the veterans, so separately from the workers. By the way, veterans got money and the workers didn't. Interesting. Um, they, they pop champagne. The, the historical record's amazing. The Monsanto lawyers are popping champagne in the judge's quarters. Because it was nothing. It was nothing. It was split between seven companies, that, that judgment. It was nothing to them. So did they feel the pressures? Did they change? I don't think so. So um, you can see I'm riled up about it. That question is a good question. I think that we need to stop these problems before they start. That's why the story of origins is so important. If this small town, we had started kind of questioning this about Roundup, perhaps we might have fixed some things about this, right? But because these things are allowed to persist, the rest of us get affected. Brendan. We posted a couple of lectures about, um, about downwinders um, after the atomic testing in the mid 20th century and, and how concerns over the radiation before it became groundwater and then grasses and then into livestock and how it became you know, more and more concentrated as it kind of went through that food chain. And then how there was lots of um, kind of grassroots opposition. And that's kind of what really started to turn the tide was kind of these broad grassroots concerns about you know, like our, our, our children are drinking this milk that we're finding has these high concentrations in you know, them. All, all these uh, radioactive chemicals. So I'm curious, do you have any sense of um, is there a, a grassroots movement? Is, is that some building? Or is kind of the, the isolated locality of it and the, the, the communities unwilling to really push against it um, kind of hampering it? Yeah, I, I, that is a great question, Brendan, because that's one of my points of this whole book, is to show that those stories we're writing about those grassroots movements are often the exception, not the rule. And that by, by, by focusing on that, we're telling these stories of like, look, well, if the people know, have the knowledge, then they'll rise up and they'll fight. This is a story where people were wide open about risks and things. And you could say they made a wise choice. There's a, there's a perfectly good read of this that says, this is the way it should have worked, right? And, that, and I respect that view. But, but in other towns like Sauge, um, or Sauge, Illinois, which is where Monsanto produced PCBs, you didn't see that town rising up. Uh, that town was 150 people. They're not rising up against Monsanto over the production of PCBs, again, one of the most toxic chemicals man has ever seen, because the livelihoods depended on it, because there was a big risk in doing so. And yes, yeah, some towns can overcome that. But, but one of the things I'm realizing in this story is this is a story in a period of globalization. This is a story of segregation. It is a story of some of the most important products coming from some of the smallest towns, right? And, that those t and, and being real about what the pressures are on those people to, to confront those issues. 
Because if we believe that, oh, they'll have the knowledge and then we'll stop problems because these local communities will rise up, we're not realizing that, no, that's not what's happened. These things are allowed to grow because these local, these small towns keep these things, these, these histories hidden because it's sometimes in their best interest. And that's not to indict them or to tell them it's wrong. It's to go back to this gentleman's point, which is we've got to find better policies that prevent, that sometimes help ourselves from ourselves, you know, help people protect themselves, give them the economic support they need to remediate problems instead of letting these things continue because it's the only way to keep the economy going, right? So I think we've got to write some new histories, not necessarily about the wins of those grassroots campaigns, but about the losses because they can tell us more than I think we, we know. Yes, sir. So, given that Monsanto is not the only asset of Bayer, how do you think Bayer will respond to both the increased negative publicity and the hit to their stock? Like, do you think Bayer, now that you know, Monsanto's name at least is, is, has disappeared from like, the corporation, um, do you think Bayer will come in and try to do anything with these sites, at least to get the bad publicity off of their name? What do you know? Do you, I don't know. I mean, I think at this point they don't need to do anything about Soda Springs because until this was broadcast on Facebook, uh, you know, there, there has been very little exposure. And, to, and I wonder whether when the book comes out there will be more discussion about this kind of stuff or not. Um, I don't think for Soda Springs there will be much action because I think it's still kind of out of sight and out of mind. But I think from my understanding, and I've been interviewing people you know, that worked at Monsanto and am and, and, and now reaching out to, to, to buyer because really threw a monkey wrench in my book when you're writing it and then they get bought out. But, but they, my, my feeling is their culture is very different. And I'm supposed to head to Germany next year to kind of get a sense of that. So I said go to places to actually get the sense of what's going on. I'm going to go there to actually the shareholders meeting and kind of sit around and, and watch what's happening, get a sense of that culture. But, but from people that I know have said that they're just different. And, you know, Monsanto was so litigious. And... Uh, and that's not, Bayer has done that too in their pharmaceutical stuff because they've had some pretty bad issues with that. Um, but I'm just, I'm really curious. I mean, the great thing about being a historian is I can say, you know, we can't be prophets. I don't really know, right, what the future is going to hold as, as they take over. Um, but I'll be interested to see if we see like a more environmentally conscious um, movement within the, within the firm. Yes, sir. So I'm an agriculturalist in my science, and uh, I've used Roundup extensively. I'm curious to know if you have evaluated some of the positive sides of Roundup, because clearly, yeah, there's environmental costs, as there are with most technologies. But what do you view as the potential upside of that technology? It was incredible. I mean, I've been interviewing farmers precisely to get to the human story of, like, people keep focusing when they write histories of Monsanto on, like, they went into the Bush administration and they bought out the Bush administration and that's how we got Roundup everywhere and you know and all this stuff. It worked. It was like magic. That's the word you keep hearing from farmers, right? Um, and it worked because and it worked and it was also seen as like a really good environmental choice at the time. They really thought this was well, think about it. The reason it's coming out in the 1970s is because T45T is so toxic. And they're saying, well, let's find something that doesn't do this. And they were so excited about Roundup. And there's a lot of good reason to say that the science is pretty sound on this, that it was an enzyme inhibitor. And it, it affected a plant enzyme that actually isn't in humans. So there's, a, there's no reason to think it would have these effects on us and these types of things. So, so I think there's a, you know, if you talk to weed scientists, which I've been doing day in and day out, they'll tell you that this was seen as the best thing. And, and they still say that, that Roundup is a good thing. And they would disagree with the jury. And there's sweet scientists that just gave a talk at a conference in uh, Michigan. They had the big conference that was saying, I disagree with this, you know, the science that this causes cancer, and here's why. I didn't get to go to the talk. But, um, so, so there's a lot of evidence to suggest this stuff actually is pretty good compared to a lot of the other alternatives. The problem there, though, as you probably are aware, is that we've created Roundup-resistant weeds now, <laughs> which is why my weed scientists are pissed at Monsanto because they were trying to tell Monsanto, by doing this, you're creating natural selection pressures. It's a basic environmental history. You're going to have ragweed. You're going to have uh, Palmer amaranth and all these things that are going to grow like wild. And that's what's happened. 
And so we've actually seen an uptick in the use of herbicides. The whole point of this was Roundup Ready technology was to reduce herbicide use. It's now going up. So one of the things I'm charting is like, not whether this genetically engineered foods cause us to have a third ear, but did it work as deployed? For a short term, we saw incredible, you know, farmers were like, my fields are just clean, you know? But in the long run, because of this resistance issue, we overused it. We're starting to see the need for those older herbicides, and some of them not so good. And the wheat scientists are just, what's the future? Dicamba, of course, is the one they're using now. And um, man, this is a pretty intense product because dicamba is volatile. And we're using dicamba to try and kill Roundup resistant weeds. But dicamba, as farmers will say, it jumps. Unlike Roundup that stays where you put it, it actually will jump. Uh, it will go up into the air and go to other farms. So in Arkansas and in my home states of the deep south, we're seeing farmers filing lawsuits because their crops were wiped out by dicamba, which shifted onto their farm, and they didn't have dicamba-resistant crops. Monsanto's selling dicamba-resistant seeds as well now. So, they're, so Monsanto is solving a problem they helped create and then creating a nut. So there's this kind of cyclical problem issue with this that I think farmers are getting really frustrated with, as are the weed scientists. Long answer, but... Um, it's unclear, I think we're seeing in this moment, what, what the future of this is going to be uh, for glyphosate. Thank you all very much. This was great. I appreciate it.